Welcome back as we continue our exploration of skeletal muscle. And in this section, we're going to learn more details about the microscopic anatomy of a skeletal muscle cell. So the first thing we need to do was talk terminology. I know you know the parts of a cell, but in muscle cell, we're going to take some of those muscle prefixes and put them to use. So the plasma membrane of the cell, and the other name was plasma lemma, in muscle is called the sarcolemma. Okay, so it's not a sarcomembrane or a myomembrane, but it's a sarcolemma. The cytoplasm is going to be called the sarcoplasm, and the endoplasmic reticulum is going to be called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So here's a picture where you clearly can see on this elongated skeletal muscle cell the sarcolemma on the outside. And you see this light blue radiator, old fashioned radiator looking structure? That's what the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the smooth ER in a skeletal muscle cell looks like. It's quite a different appearance than what you may have thought. Okay. So here's another picture. So on this one, let's go ahead and identify some things. So do you see the big purple nuclei which are pushed to the outside of the cells? The, why are there more than one showing? That's right, because muscle cells are multinucleated. Next, we have the yellow sarcolemma, the plasma membrane completely enclosing this one cell. Also, we have the bright blue sarcoplasmic reticulum and just to refresh your memory, smooth ER, one of its functions is to store calcium and that is a super important function when it comes to muscle. So we'll be talking a lot about that this whole semester. Um, I want you to look at the way the sarcoplasmic reticulum is, what, what you notice is periodically we have these areas that basically are traveling across the muscle cell width. And these are the ends of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And so these are called terminal cisterns. So these terminal cisterns are big and they are going to have a lot of stored calcium. And what you will notice is between two adjacent terminal cisterns, there is a lilac colored structure, which we'll get to in a second. Um, before I get to that, these orangey structures here and that you see a plethora of, these are all mitochondria. So just in this picture, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, like 10 mitochondria to give you the idea lots of ATP is going to be made and used. So what are all these red and pink structures? These are all long myofibrils we're going to learn about in a few slides, okay? In addition, there's going to be glycogen in this cell because the energy source, you know, stored form of glucose can be glycogen. And there's also going to be the protein which contains oxygen called myoglobin. Um, we're not going to talk about those uh, for a while. So when we need them, we will come back and talk about them. All right, now let's go back to that lilac structure between two adjacent terminal cisterns of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And that goes across the width or in a transverse plane. So it's called a transverse tubule. Only you don't have to write transverse tubule. You can just write T tubule, okay? So if you're reading in your book and you're reading about a T-tubule and later you're reading about a transverse tubule, they are the same structure. So let's talk about calcium for a second. Most of the calcium in a skeletal muscle cell is not floating around in the cytoplasm where you might expect it. And that's because high cytosolic levels, high levels in the cytosol are lethal. The cell will die because it reacts with phosphate, you get calcium phosphate crystals, crystals, and that precipitates a chain of reactions where the cell commits suicide. Series of reaction where the cell kills itself. So if we were actually to look at how much calcium was floating around in the cytosol, there would be 10,000 times the amount 
in the cytoplasmic reticulum. So we have lots of calcium here in the cytoplasmic reticulum. So that's going to be important later on. So let's talk about the teeth tubule for a second. Go back and look at the yellow sarcolemma. And do you notice periodically, like where I'm pointing with the arrow, there are these little, looks like little indentations, like someone took their finger and poked, okay? That is the entrance to a teeth tubule. So if you think about the outside of the cell being bathed in a fluid that has certain ions, that same fluid is traveling down the T-tubule across the entire width of the muscle cell, okay. right next to the two adjacent terminal cisterns of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the T tubule, even though they're showing it in purple, is made from sarcolemma. So you could have made it yellow if you were doing your own drawing. And it digs deep. And these are attached to the terminal cisterns. And if you notice, these three structures are traveling together and they're completely surrounding a group of myofibrils so that all myofibrils are connected to this, as well as being connected to the outside of the cell because of the opening in the sarcolemma. So whatever interstitial fluid is out here travels down the T tubule and is going around all the myofibrils for the entire muscle cell. So we, in skeletal muscle, we have this very important triad a T-tubule in the middle, and then a terminal cistern on each side. So let's talk about the myofibrils for a second. These are long cords, long strips of protein, and that's what's making up 90 plus percent of the muscle cell. And the myofibril is made up of a bunch of proteins, and so the proteins are called myofilaments. Okay. And there's three different categories. There's a thick one, which we'll come to learn shortly, is called myosin. There is a thin one, which we'll come to learn is called actin. And there is an elastic one, one that has stretch and return to resting length capabilities, and that one's going to be called titan. So when we're talking about myofibrils in general, we can use these descriptive words like it's thick or it's thin or it's elastic. But if I'm asking you to label, you cannot label thick, thin, or elastic. You're going to have to give the real names. Myosin, actin, and titan. And you will see that when we get to the labeling pictures. All right. So here's our muscle fibers on the left side. And we're going to pull out one muscle cell. And then we're going to pull out one myofibril. Well, if it's thick, it's thin, and it's elastic fibers and some other proteins we ha haven't even talked about yet. And so as we said before, there's alternating dark and light. So in the light microscope picture on the right, on the left, we have the drawing and then we have an electron microscope picture. And so this wider area right here, this is the darker band. And then to the left of it, as well as to the right of it, that is the lighter band. And yes, that dark line is in the middle of the lighter band, because if you look on the light band to the picture on your right, you can see that there's a very skinny little dark band in the middle of every light band. You just didn't notice it before because you didn't have a high enough magnification. So there are 10 to 12 different things we need to learn about the structure of skeletal muscle. The first structure, this dark area, this is called the dark band, but the dark band has a name and it's called the A band. So it's very easy to remember the vowel in dark is an A, so this is called the A band. Okay, no, it's not named for the word dark. It doesn't have anything to do with it. Um, we're going to have two different bands, an A band and an I band, and they're named for Latin terms, an isotropic and isotropic. They just happen to fit with the vowels in the English language, so we're very lucky for that. So the dark band is the A band, 
and the light band is going to be the I band. And they're clearly delineated on the picture. Now, in the middle of the I band, we have that dark line. And that dark line is called a Z disc or a Z line. Okay. In reality, it's not a straight line, it's actually kind of a zigzag line. Okay, so in all the different pictures, it's going to look a little bit differently. Sometimes, like when you're drawing a stick figure thing, you're just going to draw it as a straight line. But in other pictures, it'll show the Z thing. And it doesn't matter if disc is D-I-S-C or D-I-S-K. I'll take all of those terms. So why is the Z disc important? Because it defines the structural unit of skeletal muscle, which is called a sarcomere. So a sarcomere goes from one Z disc to the next adjacent Z disc. So the Z line is marking the beginning and the end of the sarcomere. So the sarcomere is everything in between it. So take a minute, look at this picture. Realize where the A bands are, where the two I bands are located. Do you see the Z disc in the middle of the I band? And can you then outline the length of a sarcomere? So pause it and do those things real quickly. Okay. So the other thing I want you to notice on this, on the two cells closest to you, you can see that they have drawn in, what's the blue structure? That's right, the sarcoplasmic reticulum with its terminal cisternal. And what's the yellow structure? The T tubules. So you can see the triads. And notice that the triads are actually located at the interface between the A band and the I band. They do not align with the Z disc. Okay. So a little bit histology. Look at this picture. Can you clearly see A bands and I bands more than just the one that is indicated? All right. How about in this picture? All right. Go back to both of these pictures and pick out Z lines. All right. Now with your fingers, go there and mark a tiny little sarcomere. Did you get something like that? From the middle of one I band to the middle of the next I band, because that's where the two Z lines are. Perfect. All right, you've got it. So, and every myofibril, there's going to be tens of thousands of sarcomeres. And each one of those has to contract for the muscle to shorten. Plus, a lot of myofibrils have to contract for the muscle to shorten. Okay. And so we say the sarcomere is the functional unit of the muscle. So we're going to learn how the proteins in the sarcomere are arranged and how they work. But here's what I want you to do next. This is an electron microscope picture and it's labeled an A band, an I band and a Z line. And I want you to only using the words A bands and I bands, don't tell me about Z lines, how would you define the length of a sarcomere? Are you having trouble with that? So instead of saying, I don't know, I don't know what she's talking about, just give me the answer so I can move on. What I need you to do is think, what did I miss? Okay. So go back to your definition. What is an A band and what is an I band? And what is a sarcomere? Now, just talking about A bands and I bands, define the length of a sarcomere. Yeah, we're gonna pause while you do this. Okay, did you come up with one A and one I? Yeah, you're wrong. Did you come up with one A and two I's? Yeah, that's wrong too. You need to figure this out. Got any questions, send me an email. That's the end for this part.
and I will see you shortly as we continue on. So before you continue on, figure out the answer to that question. Thank you for all your work and I'll see you shortly.